Uh, my thanks to Ken and to all the other organizers of this. It, it's really a delight to be here uh, with uh, Professor Mori and all of you to talk about the fact that certain ideas have affordances. That, in other words, there are ways that certain kinds of essays, certain kinds of deep insights, um, open themselves up for use in, in many, many ways by many, many people. And so I'm going to talk about a kind of very small thing as a way to make a larger point about the impact of um, the Uncanny Valley. And my talk today is called From a Bark to a Meme. As Ken mentioned, I, I wrote a piece recently called The Factory Model of Desire, in which I talked about Walt Disney and Hugh Hefner, Walt Disney of the Disney Company, Hugh Hefner of Playboy, and how I actually feel they're the same person addressing different demographics, children and girls. <laughs> and um, I, I also, I, I concluded that essay by talking about the fact that they were two men who, who almost were pioneers in finding the Uncanny Valley, and I was really literalizing the notion of the Uncanny Valley as having both a northern and a southern root, and the way that roboticists have tended to think about this, uh, the Uncanny Valley, I call the southern root, which is the creation of the uncanny out of um, the inanimate making it animate, but I was particularly interested in the ways in which people like Hugh Hefner took animate humans and turn them into the uncanny by way of surgery and um, also Photoshop. So what you have here is a kind of distillation in three images of um, the, the uncanny valley as I was discussing it. You have Jessica Rabbit from Robert Zemeckis' Who Framed Roger Rabbit as the kind of animation, uh, you know, how uncanny is she? Then you have the cover of Playboy's Sex in the Cinema issue from 1988, where playmate Laura Richmond is manipulated both through surgery, I assume, uh, but also definitely through, um, uh, through Photoshop, that waste. And then finally, a recent um, student project was a robot designed to mimic Jessica Rabbit's own movements. Um, if anyone could give me the actual, I can't find whose class that was. Someone posted that to YouTube delightfully two months ago in time for me to do this talk. Um, so the two quotes that I'm going to be going off of were both from the 1970s by two key thinkers of our age. Right? The first we are so lucky to have here today, and this is from his interview from um, last year. And he said, I think of myself in the story Hanasaka Jisan. I bark, dig here, and then other people will dig and find treasure. I think everyone in this room has been digging and finding treasure in that space. I, and, and, and so um, what kind of idea is that? What is that digging? And I would say that, you know, it, it, contemporaneously, the English biologist uh, Richard Dawkins was talking about the development of the meme. The meme as an idea that has an affordance that allows it to propagate itself. And he says memes propagate themselves in the meme pool by leaping from brain to brain via a process which, in the broad, in the broad sense, can be called imitation. I mean, these same words keep coming up time after time. So here's some, you know, basic ideas about cultural information, natural selection, self-propagation, and the meme. There's the cover of the book that this comes from, The Selfish Gene, and here is uh, that picture of Dawkins. But recently, in internet culture, memes have become defined. Because remember, memes are constantly replicating, constantly generating. The word meme itself has come to mean something a little bit different, right? On the internet, a meme is an image with a text on it. So this is one I found on I Can Has Cheeseburger. Um, right? I was into memes before it went mainstream. So my question for you today is, is the uncanny valley a meme? Right? And I'm going to look at American culture in specific, and I would completely agree with the previous speaker. Um, this is not something that regenerated in 2002. This is something that has been, and I will be showing work primarily from the last seven to ten years. And so let's just take a look at how it's been propagating through North American culture. 
Here uh, is a, someone interested in trans and post-humanism, literally doubling the uh, Uncanny Valley uh, to create a series of pretty, pretty dippy sine curves. But um, OK, we'll, we'll leave that aside. Um, here is uh, one of the great essayists in America, Lawrence Weschler, who writes regularly for The New Yorker, among other places, who wrote, uh, whose, whose last book was called The Uncanny Valley. Uh, Adventures in Narrative, um, when at, he said he could not find a picture of Professor Morey when he was doing his research. I'm lucky enough to be able to look at him. Uh, take that, Lawrence Wessler. Um, now, let's start moving from the sublime to the ridiculous and unfunny celebrity oriented joke in Wired Magazine. Right? Popular culture, 30 Rock, a very famous. Um, often funny situation comedy, uh, and, and this is from six years ago when he's literally holding that up, uh, he's holding this up to dissuade another character from making a 3D pornographic animated film, and he's trying to tell him that it just won't work, right? But he's, he's using real science to do this to make the joke. Um, to move from comedy to police procedurals, you have a show called Criminal Minds, two years ago did an episode called The Uncanny Valley in which the dastardly villain took living women and turned them into dolls, right? Uh, I don't know what this is. It has the title The Uncanny Valley. Your guess is as good as mine. That appears to be Nicolas Cage being held by something. Um, I actually think the Uncanny Valley is a great name for a performance space, and there is a performance space in Long Island City, New York, called just that. I'm not sure it's a great name for a literary magazine, but it doesn't matter because there is a literary magazine called the Uncanny Valley. And then, for those who are into indie music, the first winner of the Pitchfork poll for best indie band ever was um, the Dismemberment Plan. They broke up nine years ago, and their first album that was released last month is called The Uncanny Valley. So, I mean, what you see then is that, that this is a concept that is floating around with people like Lawrence Weschler, who understand it deeply, with people who I don't th under think understand it at all, like that guy who did the painting. Um, but it doesn't really matter, because ideas sometimes take on lives of their own. But I promised you, right, to investigate whether or not the Uncanny Valley was a meme as it is now defined by the internet. And I, uh, I can point to uh, knowyourmeme.com, right? And there is a listing for the Uncanny Valley, but it being the internet, there are dissenters. And the dissenters, one four years ago said, the Uncanny Valley is not a meme. It is not a subculture. It is not a person. It is not related to the internet in any way. It does not belong on Know Your Meme. <laughs> Otakus are everywhere. Um, and what mimetic materials have people made to exploit the Uncanny Valley? Was asked just one, one year ago. I'm happy to report that I can has cheeseburger delivered. <laughs> I found this, I did not make this. The Uncanny Valley. And to think this was made to look charming and cute. So <laughs> all I can say is that um, we are lucky enough to have now, you know, a new translation of an incredibly influential piece, not only in the sciences, not only in animation, but literally uh, all over. In the humanities, I do a lot of digital humanities. It's present there. It's present in the arts. It's present, obviously, in popular culture. And so I generated my own meme. This California thanks you. <laughs>